War of the Worlds is not the first alien invasion story, but it is the most well-known and widely read, so it gets the credit. And it sets the framework for the hard invasion, the kind where a military force drops out of the sky and starts blowing things up, as opposed to a body snatcher's infiltration scenario. Written between 1895 and 1897, War of the Worlds is fundamentally a 19th century imperialism story. Colonizers with vastly superior technology arrive, and despite their small numbers, they plow through the primitive natives. The invaders are unstoppable until they succumb to disease. Bantus with spears can't stop Englishmen with Maxim guns. But malaria can. Since then, War of the Worlds itself, like the alien invasion genre more broadly, has been reinvented over and over to stay relevant to changing times. The 1950s were a sort of golden age for alien invasion stories. For example, in The Day the Earth Stood Still, a more advanced civilization drops in to let us know that we need to straighten up and fly right or it's not going to end well for us. This Island Earth gets into the proxy war aspect I'll talk about in a bit. And of course, the slate of schlocky saucer men taking our women movies that was deftly parodied with Mars Attacks. And amidst all this was the 1953 adaptation of War of the Worlds, now set in Los Angeles as the British Empire's place as the leading world power had passed to America. The world had changed a bit since the 1890s, a couple world wars and the collapse of the old European colonial empires, and the 53 film marinates in that, while it begins with the preamble from Wells' novel, as most subsequent adaptations do. No one would have believed in the middle of the 20th century that human affairs were being watched keenly by intelligences greater than man's. Scrutinizing us, as we do cells under a microscope. Across the gulf of space, intellects, vast and cool and unsympathetic, slowly and surely drawing their plans against us. This British critique of British colonialism by a British socialist is largely overtaken by American fears of the time. War with unstoppable waves of communists, immigration to some extent, and most striking to me, a loss of faith in technology as a mechanism for steady progress. Perhaps best shown with the sequence of the army trying to stem the Martian advance with an atomic bomb dropped by the most futuristic bomber of the time, Northrop's YB-49 prototype, which incidentally never entered service. The bomb detonates over the Martian war machines, and the soldiers nervously wait for the cloud to clear, only to reveal the Martians still advancing unscathed. This is repeated almost exactly in numerous other alien invasion films, perhaps most notably in Independence Day. Mankind's most devastating weapon is completely ineffectual against this outside force. It's like fighting fire with a sword. Independence Day is also a fine example of the change in reasons for the invasion. Stories like War of the Worlds are riffing on colonialism. They're here for our land, they want territory. But this gradually shifts until we get to films like Independence Day, Battle Los Angeles, or the miniseries V, where they are explicitly here for resources. It reflects changes in the real world. Western countries don't set up colonies in Africa anymore, but corporations run mines there with local labor at dirt cheap wages. Which honestly is worse. At least colonialists built infrastructure in cities, established schools. They were there for more than just to strip valuables from the ground and leave a pit. The Martians in War of the Worlds came to Earth to make it home. Mars was dying and they watched our green, watery world, the jewel of the solar system, a place where they could flourish. The visitors in V are mostly here for water, and while it makes no sense traveling interstellar distances to pump water out of a gravity well, narratively it's notable. Earth is a source of raw materials, water and food, for a greater power engaged in a war. Earth is to the visitors what Romania was to Germany in World War II, a client state providing a vital commodity, in that case oil. That the visitors are iconic space Nazis only reinforces the comparison. Independence Day takes it further. They're like locusts. They're moving from planet to planet. Their whole civilization. After they've consumed every natural resource, they move on. We're a road trip Twinkie to be consumed and the packaging discarded before driving on to the next stop. And it's noteworthy that these are all American films made during a time when America was the dominant power in the world. It's from the Americans. They want to organize a counteroffensive. Oh, it's about bloody time. Just as War of the Worlds was written in the context of a dominant British empire. 
These stories can be enjoyed on their own merits, but their full impact comes from the context of a dominant civilization, one that has overcome threats and crushed its enemies, having a buried fear of being on the receiving end of what it's doled out. And this is where we get to more recent series, like 2016's Colony or 2011's Falling Skies. Stories where we're invaded, but not because we've done anything or that they want our planet, but because we're Poland or Afghanistan. We're in the way of greater powers and consequently become a battleground. Falling Skies kind of dumps this at the end, but the bulk of the series follows this battleground Earth kind of thing. The premise in Falling Skies is that one day these spidery guys attacked. Skitters, they call them, and they do a fine job of stomping organized militaries, leaving survivors to form militias and try to carry on the fight. One of them is led by a badass history teacher with a Kalashnikov, which I appreciate. Oh yeah, I could use an extra clip. Mag. Yeah, that's what I meant. But the core is that the aliens are here, they swatted us out of the way, and we don't know what the hell they want. A few seasons in, another group of aliens, the Volm, show up. They're the other side of this war, and Cochise here acts as an advisor to this militia, the Second Massachusetts, much like Green Berets in Vietnam. These American militias, like the Viet Cong or the Mujahideen, are fighting for their land and their freedom from foreign domination, yes, but it's inextricably linked with the goals of a greater power from outside, one that, like the Soviet Union or the United States, is concerned with the survival of its proxies only so far as they, we in this case, aid their objectives in their war. No, I mean the Volm. Where the hell did you guys go? Did your father turn his back on us? My father does not consider you much at all when it comes to larger Volm operations. This is done even better in This Island Earth, the book by Raymond Jones, not the film adaptation that ditched most of the really interesting ideas. The story brings in the idea of making strategic decisions based entirely on computer projections. If I understand your operations thoroughly enough, said Cal, the purpose of the computers is chiefly that of prediction. Of course, said Raycopt, that is obvious. You predict what the Guara will do on the basis of their strength, and also what you should do to best counter and attack their forces. Yes. But the Guara also have computers. Such reliance on pure logic and number crunching makes them predictable, and fighting a war that way is a slow road to defeat. In both This Island Earth and Falling Skies, we're shown one side of a war that's locked into certain assumptions, giving their enemies a lever to drive them away from actions that might win them the war. But both also show us humans as proxies, used for a time and then abandoned. It's a lesson all nations should understand when a stronger power uses them in a war. The proxy gets dropped as soon as the cost exceeds the benefit. Looking at you, Crane. But while Falling Skies depicts America turned into a war zone, Colony depicts an occupation. We're part of the war effort, providing labor in factories, both as hired workers and slave labor on the moon. They separate out those who can be used as soldiers in their war, preparing an army of foreign recruits with echoes of the French Foreign Legion or the Waffen-SS. And the occupation is administered by our own people. The Los Angeles colony is run by a suitably compliant and self-serving man who previously worked for a small college. The brutal enforcement of the colony's laws is done by human police, recruits who sign up on the promise of better rations, oppressing their fellow citizens in the hope of being slightly less oppressed themselves. The Warsaw Ghetto had the Judenrat. The Los Angeles Colony has the Red Hats. And of all the alien invasion stories over the years, Colony arguably does the best job of portraying an analog of foreign invasion in the modern sense. They're not colonizing, they aren't setting up communities of alien settlers with the space cavalry riding out to clear us natives from the area. Like a grittier version of V, the invasion doesn't lead to constant war or an apocalyptic wasteland, but rather an amplification of all the worst elements of what we already have. The laws get more restrictive, the police more violent, the bureaucracy more capricious, and the taxes much higher, up to direct forced labor instead of merely taking a portion of wages. It's not so much being conquered, it's just having all the worst aspects of our current neoliberal political order turned up to 11. But the categorization of these stories isn't a neat progression from colonialism stories to resource war stories to proxy war techno-tyranny analogies. They all blur together and fold into each other, which we see with the steady flow of War of the Worlds remakes. Multiple films, both big-budget studio productions and low-budget knockoffs, various TV adaptations and spin-offs. There was even a musical. Of 
All of them, to some extent, try to adapt the story to their own time, whether by setting it in the present day, like Spielberg's 2005 film, remapping dialogue to issues of the day. They can't occupy this country. Occupations always fail. History's taught us that a thousand times. Or keeping the story set roughly in the original period, but adjusting the messaging. For example, the 2019 BBC miniseries, which shifts the focus from the colonial war aspect of it to the ecological catastrophe of the Martian. Aeroforming, I guess would be the term. But at its core, War of the Worlds is a 19th century story, and some scenes don't translate well. I always chuckle a bit when the local garrison being called up gets transformed into a modern mechanized unit showing up and parking tanks in a line to wait for the Martians as though Napoleon were in charge and someone told him that tanks are just cannons that pull themselves. I find it particularly curious because H.G. Wells foresaw Great War-style armored warfare in his 1905 story The Land Ironclads, while people adapting War of the Worlds, people who live in a world where tank battles have happened, just put them in a line to sit there and get zapped with Martian heat rays. Speaking of tanks, we see War of the Worlds absorbing themes of dehumanizing mechanization with attempts to blend the Martian invasion with the Great War. While it's oversimplifying to say that it was the first modern industrial scale war, it was on a scale far in excess of anything prior and saw a number of innovations from tanks to combat aircraft to widespread use of machine guns by European armies fighting each other, as opposed to slaughtering natives several steps down on the technological ladder. There's definite parallels between the idea of being invaded by technologically superior aliens and fighting or living under a technologically advanced state with hostile tendencies, not only in terms of direct threat, but via surveillance. The camera tentacle of War of the Worlds evolves into the Orwellian surveillance state of colony, and finally with the 2019 War of the Worlds series that begins with the invaders wiping out most of humanity with a weapon that we can't see, feel, or fight, able to shut down our bodies due to detailed knowledge of how our brains work. It's a rather blunt allegory for an oppressive surveillance state that knows everything about us and can snuff any of us out if we become too troublesome. The only way to survive was to literally go underground. But invasions don't have to involve soldiers or tripod walkers, and force and fear aren't the only mechanisms of control. The genre also gives us numerous takes on infiltration, conquering us without even noticing. Two of the most famous being Invasion of the Body Snatchers and its multiple iterations, and of course, They Live. While Body Snatchers gives us the horrifying and perhaps oddly familiar premise of our friends and neighbors being replaced by pod-grown duplicates, They Live shows a top-down approach that is sharply on point. Our billionaire class aren't literal space aliens, but the people at the top of our society, those with the majority of wealth and political power, have different priorities than the rest of us do. Maybe even malicious intentions in some cases. We're distracted from this by controlled narratives and consumerism. Mass media exists to make us buy things, both literally and in a figurative sense. The story of the down-and-out drifter John Nada discovering the truth of the lie he lives in is even more relevant today, with the extent of media manipulation and censorship so widely known and trust in institutions rapidly crumbling after years of blatant incompetence and or malice. They Live shows us a world in which we can believe we're free, but it's freedom within an illusion. What zookeepers call enrichment. But sometimes we bump up against the edge of the enclosure and we realize how small our range is. Which is why I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the silence from Doctor Who. They go a step further than They Live's blue scullies with the ability to implant strong suggestions in the human subconscious, not only letting them dictate policy at the highest levels of government simply by telling leaders what to do, but also by making humans consciously forget the encounter as soon as it ends. There can be no resistance because even if they are revealed, no one will remember to act on the knowledge. Unless, of course, the silence can be tricked into ordering their own extermination in some piece of media that nearly everyone will see at least once in their life. That's one small step for man. You should get a small fight. The bulbous headed alien said it, not me. But not all alien invasions are overtly hostile. I need to mention Alien Nation, originally a 1988 film and then a short-lived series. 
Alien Nation plays off America's long history of a blurred line between invasion and immigration. The premise for this one is that in 1992, a big flying saucer full of a couple hundred thousand alien slaves crashes outside Los Angeles. After being quarantined for a while, these newcomers, which are close enough to us that they can pass in human society, are naturalized and released into the population. Echoing the cultural memory of Irish immigrants in New York and Chicago, many of them become cops. They're given new American-sounding names. I'm not going to introduce you to people as San Francisco. Uh, I think I'll call you George. And they settle on the West Coast, despite the little issue of their flesh dissolving in salt water. But it's not all bring me your huddled masses. They form their own communities, speak a foreign language, eat strange foods. Why does it gotta be sour milk they get wasted on? Why can't it be like Jack Daniels or uh, Thunderbird for Christ's sakes? What's wrong with that? Even after assimilating into suburbia, they're still seen as foreign, alien. Wow, you sure look like your mom. Oh, well, I mean, you know, that's... But as this early scene in the film depicts, the new wave of immigrants takes some of the heat off of other minority groups. You ever try to make a case down in Slagtown? A list of newcomer informants is about as long as a list of Mexican war heroes. Hey, hey, come on. White and black are united in their suspicion and dislike of the newcomers, casually tossing about racial slurs on the new outgroup. Slagtown, I hate this place. Look at this crap. I wonder if the plumbing's the same. Yeah, it is. What? Oh, man, get out of here. In this case, the hostility is exacerbated by the fact that they're physically stronger. They live longer. Their average intelligence is higher. Purists believe that if we don't have complete victory over the aliens, we will face the end of our race, our planet in our lifetime. It pits the immigrant experience of trying to adjust to a new culture up against the threat of extinction as an invasive species takes over the habitat. And through the film and TV series, it's portrayed at all levels of society. There are newcomers who have become rich within the capitalist economic structure. There are newcomer gangs taking turf on the streets of LA. And unlike straight invasion stories, there's no obvious bad guys when you get down to the granular level of the individual. Detective Francisco and his family are monstrous invaders. Albert, the precinct janitor, isn't here for world domination. Individually, they're people, co-workers, neighbors. But collectively, they are two distinct cultures vying for dominance. Which is a big part of the American story. The cultures blend, taking pieces from each other until the grandchildren of the immigrants are Americans like everyone else. And it's a question every generation has to grapple with. Who? How many? how fast. Because the difference between immigration, colonization, and invasion is really just numbers and time. And with that, everyone is waiting for me to say something really inflammatory, but the real strength of science fiction is its ability to let us talk about contemporary issues in a non-contemporary setting. It's how our culture talks about the underlying issues with war, race, immigration, without bashing headlong into contemporary politics and biases. Whether we're in 19th century England or 21st century America, we keep retelling stories of alien invasion because we're always experiencing wars and cultural tensions. We have an easier time talking about it through allegory than face on. But great sci-fi isn't just allegory. It brings something new. War of the Worlds wasn't just saying imperialism is bad for the people getting invaded. Instead, it says... What if it happened to us? It not only flipped the narrative and made people in Britain think about being on the receiving end of a colonial expedition, of seeing the death of those colonizers from disease as salvation rather than a blight to be overcome, but also made people think about Mars, about travel through space, made people consider that they might live in a bigger world than the world. And from that, a new universe of possibilities opens up. And we like to see stuff blow up, that's cool too.